What does it mean to be a bad friend? Well, Bit jealous, yeah. narcissistic, untrustworthy, selfish, perhaps disrespectful of other people's time, perhaps disrespectful of people's boundaries, so perhaps sharing secrets or hitting on somebody's girlfriend or on somebody who you know your friend likes and you don't per se like the person, but you find them attractive and you just want to gratify your own pleasure or your own sexual desires, something like that. Or you just want to get in the way of your friend achieving yeah, right, right. whatever, whether it's a, yeah, right. with a relationship, a project. Do you ever kind of wonder if that person you've been hanging out with or the friend group that you're in is not good for you or someone you know and are kind of close with keeps acting in certain ways that you find disrespectful or selfish or perhaps suspicious? I think a lot of people have experiences where they start to question their relationships and their friends and kind of wondering who's good for them and maybe they also lack the assertiveness or the courage or perhaps just the insight on how to address difficult relationships. In today's video, we are going to read from the Daily Stoic about this topic, and hopefully that can help you in that endeavor. So David, are you going to read for us? Sure. Awesome. Thanks for that intro, Mike. Okay. So this is Marcus Aurelius Meditations, Book 11, Section 15. Um, October 18th frenemies. October 18th frenemies, that's right. There's nothing worse than a wolf befriending sheep. Avoid false friendship at all costs. If you are good, straightforward, and well-meaning, it should show in your eyes and not escape notice. Okay, so I don't, I don't know what. Well, let's keep. I don't get it. So let's. I'm going to read a bit more. Yeah. Okay. Read this is not. This is. This is sort of like the commentary on that. Right, quote. and that's from uh, Ryan Holiday in his book, The Daily Stoic. Right. Yeah. It's pretty obvious that one should keep away from the wicked and two-faced as much as possible. The jealous friend, the narcissistic parent, the untrustworthy partner. At first glance, Marcus Aurelius is reminding us to avoid false friends. But what if we turn it around? What if instead we ask about the times that we have been false to our friends? Ultimately, that's what stoicism is about. Not judging other people's behavior, but judging our own. We've all been a frenemy at one point or another. We've been nice to their face, usually because there's something in it for us, but later in different company, we said how we really felt. Or we've strung someone along, cared only when things were going well, or declined to help even though someone really needed us. Yeah, that's good. I was not expecting it to go in that direction, but I love it. it it's dark. No. I was hoping we yeah. could talk about the other people that yeah, screw yeah, us yeah, over, yeah, but yeah. now it's actually turning <laughs> in the typical stoic fashion, the mirror back at us, you know. Beautiful, beautiful. Have you been a friend of me? What but, is it? What, yeah. what constitutes? How do we define? What does it mean to be a bad friend? He outlines it a wee bit there, right? So a bit jealous, of yeah. narcissistic, untrustworthy, selfish, perhaps disrespectful of other people's time, perhaps disrespectful of people's boundaries, so perhaps sharing secrets or. Uh, hitting on somebody's girlfriend or on somebody who you know your friend likes and you don't per se like the person, but you find them attractive and you just want to gratify your own pleasure or your own sexual desires, something like that. Or you just want to get in the way of, of your friend achieving yeah, right, whatever, with, whether it's a, yeah, right. with a relationship, a project, and which, you gain some joy from that, which is yeah, which is um, that's also pathological in yeah. some ways. I can't remember there's another word for it, where you take delight or, or gratification in other people's suffering, uh, which is psychopathic. So a lot, I think some people, an example, okay, so I was about to give an example of someone else. You asked me if I've ever been a friend of me. Clearly I have. I'm, we're all human beings. We've all done that for sure. I would say the clearest examples for me were through addiction, where it's, there's a saying, people, places, and things. So the people I hung out with, the things I did, the places I went were all revolved around whether or not I could get high so or stay high or have access to drugs and alcohol. And I think oftentimes I would know when I was crossing that boundary of kind of using somebody because I knew they had drugs or weed or whatever versus genuinely wanting to be around someone else. 
because I like their company. So for me, I think this comes out a lot in the addiction and the dysfunctional behavior of addiction. And sometimes I think, or I notice myself having those thoughts of what am I going to get out of this or something like that. Or it's more like a thought appears in my head of, well, if I was friends with that person, that might boost my access to X. And ooh, that would make my life better. Something like that. That's how I think these things often play out in terms of, I guess he doesn't really describe that part. That's a very self-centered, selfish approach to human relationships. I think some of the things here, he says here, he talks a little bit about uh, gossiping. That's what he sort of says here, right? Mm -hmm. At the end there, or we've strung someone along, cared only when things are going well or declined to help, even though someone really needed us. Anyway, that's a little bit of a ramble, but I think what I said shed some light on this. What about you? What are the, like, okay, so Mike, you talked about a situation where you would befriend people if they had the drugs that you wanted. But let's say we take out drugs in that scenario and the good you wanted them to provide you was a sense of, you know, feeling good about yourself. So it wasn't through drugs. It was through positive encouragement. They were just like really, wow, you're Mike, you're doing awesome. You're smart. You're such a good golfer. You're a really good therapist. You're a good business person, whatever you wanted to hear. And you befriend that person because they're, they make you feel good. Not, so in one situation, it's because they give you the, the substance you want. In another situation, they give you the compliments that you want. Is it bad to be a friend? Does that change? We befriend those that make us feel good, right? Like you and I are friends because I think we enjoy chatting with one another and I feel better about myself after I've spoken to you. Does that mean I'm like not thinking about friendship in the right way? And often I don't want to hang out with people that make me feel not great about myself mm -hmm. or not, at least not good about myself or bad about myself. Is that, have I missed what friendship ought to be? What, like what, what is a, what should Marcus Aurelius tell us? Who do we be friends with? Is there a role for self-interest and selfishness in deciding who our friends are? I think, yes. I, what it seems we're trying to aim at here is when does that become or turn into at the expense of others, right? Yeah. I think one thing I was thinking about earlier before the line of stoicism is about not judging other people's behavior, but judging our own. I hear clients often will share about how they're always the support person, right? Or, or somebody always comes to them with their problems and either doesn't want to listen in return or doesn't listen to the request of, I can't listen to you complain about your problems anymore. You need to go get help somewhere else. Or, you know, I'm your friend, but this is too much. But then the person just can't hear that, doesn't receive it, and they persist in the behavior. And then it's hard for people to, and this actually might be, I don't know if frenemy is the right thing, but if we don't say something to that person and continue the boundary, then we are being, I don't know about frenemy, but then we are being, in some sense, we're stringing people along or we are, we are being false, right? So we asked about the times that we have been false to our friends. So not speaking up about a friend's behavior is being false in a sense, right? If that person's close to you. So I, I often think about in my recovery, a lot of the friends I used to be friends with, I'm not really friends with anymore for various reasons, life interests, etc. Also, they still drink and drug a lot. Am I being a false friend by not expressing to them that I think their behavior is unhelpful and that kind of idea? And I think if I spent a lot of time with one of those, with those people and didn't say something, then I think I'd be being a false friend. I don't spend that much time with those people anymore. And I don't really think it's my place to say anything. If I was asked for help, I would clearly help for sure. Yeah. So that's sort of where, again, it's a bit tricky. Like, I don't know. I think I have over the past, like, whatever, 13 years almost since I've been sort of sober, I've had to learn how to be a friend again or, or how to be a friend in a way that is more genuine and authentic and not clouded by using and getting high with people all the time. Right, like a more reciprocal... Something like that, yeah. Ryan Holiday talks about, we asked about the times we've been false to our friends. There's a debate in like, you know, moral philosophy about the ethics of lying. So like, Mike, imagine you're always 
honest with me about my my failings, my the things that I'm annoying that annoy you, or like we actually sometimes like have to be false to our friends and to our partners and to our parents because isn't there a isn't there a place for like the noble lie in a relationship where you're like yeah that person's struggling with it but i'm not going to say anything because it's going to make them feel worse and then it's going to affect the relationship it's going to make it a bit uncomfortable or toxic let's just talk about other positive things or if a friend is struggling with something maybe i'll give them encouragement deep down i'm like yeah i, I don't think they're doing the right thing but it's not my place to tell them to do X, Y, and Z instead. So I'm just going to be like, hey, if you think that's the best approach, you know, go for it. I got your back, whatever you need. Even though deep down you're like, yeah, you probably should do something different. Is okay. that frenemy falseness and therefore bad behavior? Or is that just navigating complex interpersonal relationships and sort of knowing when to say something, knowing when to not say something? When to be true, when to be a bit less true, just for, you know, for good diplomatic relationship-based reasons. I think the two main things I would say is, one, I, well, one, I don't believe in the noble lie. So, no, I don't think it's okay to lie to people. Again, unless your physical safety is at risk. Mm -hmm. I think we've maybe talked about this at some point in re previous videos. So, if somebody came and knocked on my door and said, right, right now, and they couldn't see you. And they said, is David Zarnett here? I want to slice his head off. Yeah. Right? I would say, no, he's not here. Right. right. Other than situations such as those, I don't really think lying is ever useful. Now, that is different than, or noble, right? Or ethical. I think that's different than me hanging out with my old buddies who still drink and drug and choosing not to express my concern for them. Because I think that's what you're asking in a way, right? So in those moments, again, if I'm asked, I will clearly express myself. If somebody's in really, really rough shape, then I will probably say something. So another example might be a, a bunch of those buddies went up to a, have a boys weekend or whatever, and primarily to drink and drug, right? And I was invited, and I was speaking to one of them, mm -hmm. and I said, I don't really want to go. One, I couldn't go, but the other was, I don't really want to go because you guys will be drinking and drugging the whole time and I don't want to do, be around that. And so in that moment, I was very honest with that person about why I wasn't going, right? And I, that person wasn't like, oh, I drink and drug too much. Mike, can you help me, right? right? And if they had been, I would have been happy to help them. So I think that kind of that's the determination of there's a time and a place for certain things. And I don't think that that's lying. Right. Right. It might just involve not saying everything that's on your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Because right. if, if humans said everything that was on their mind all the time, right. actually, we'd probably have more compassion for each other. But at the same time, probably be a lot more conflict because we're not capable of navigating that. So the first sentence of Holiday's summary of Aurelius or sort of quick analysis, it, it, I'll, I'll read it again. It's pretty obvious that one should keep away from the wicked and two-faced as much as possible. The jealous friend, the narcissistic parent, the untrustworthy partner. So in the concept of frenemies, referring to friends, the jealous friend and the untrustworthy partner, it makes sense, right? Like we're often best friends with our, like our wives. I mean, mm -hmm. like they're one of our many best friends and that makes sense. But the parent, he puts in the narcissistic parent as a part of a, as a frenemy. Now I know he's talking generally about relationships, but I thought that was an interesting because parents are mm -hmm. like, are we are we trying to be friends with our with our kids? But I guess it's I guess a larger point about thinking about who we are close with and who we're not, whether it's a a colleague, a closer friend, or someone we're close with, maybe we shouldn't be friends with, or a parent. I don't know. I thought the I thought the parent example felt out of out of place, or or just sort of thought provoking. It's like why, when in the context of friendship, why are we talk about child parent relationships, which seem to be a different category, but maybe not. Yeah, it does seem out of place. One thought is, until you're about twenty five years old in general modern times, it's very difficult to get your needs met and live in our society without having your parents help you for those people who are lucky enough to have parents around. So in that context, 
you know, maybe there's some skillfulness or ways you can have a little bit of boundaries with it, with your parents, and in particular, if one of them's narcissistic. Beyond that, perhaps we have more agency over our behavior. And I have worked with many people who have, I think the word narcissist and all that stuff is far overused today, but many people people that I've worked with who have parents who have narcissistic traits find ways to create healthier boundaries. Well, that's the aim. And so in that context, you know, once you have a bit more autonomy and self-sufficiency, then it's possible to create boundaries with a parent. Right. I think maybe we can blend that into this idea of friendships. Sometimes people put up with terrible relationships because they don't have any other options, right? Or they are they fear being alone and all those things are totally valid. And in those cases, people often need to learn how to create a rela healthier relationships. And I was talking about this with someone the other day and it comes up often. You know, it's not your fault per se that you're in this situation, but it's your responsibility to find your way out of it. Right? It's not your fault you grew up with crazy parents and a horrible family and a terrible life situation, but it's your responsibility to figure out how to get yourself out of there right. or how to improve your situation. And that's a bitter pill to swallow. And it's a message that's been reiterated for thousands and thousands of years. And yet we continue to forget. And I think that's why practices like Stoicism, Buddhism, AA, which is probably a blend of both of those things, whatever, any sort of spiritual personal development endeavor that's rooted in wisdom and is about, this isn't about other people, this is about me, this is about us, this is about our job to take responsibility for our shit and do something about it and not blame our life circumstance and the person, people around us. And it's very hard to break out of that because it's it's almost gratifying to just absolve oneself of responsibility. Do you, uh, I guess two questions for you, Mike. Do you like your friend group? Like, are you like when you take a macro look at your life or, you know, your birthday party each year and you look around, like these are the people <laughs> that are close to me are like, okay, I've done well, or mm, I wish, you know, I wish I was surrounded by better people or people who have more of my interests. And two, do you, do you make friends easily? So do you like your friend group at a at the uh, sort of the deepest, most fundamental level? Are you satisfied with it? And do you do you befriend easily? I want to turn that question around to you. Yeah. It's a great question. So I think yes. So I, I should say I, I asked yes. you because I think a, a lot about both. Okay. Um, in my own. Yeah. yeah. I would say now I have a blend of friends, most of which I've met post recovery. I do hang out with some of my older friends, but not as frequently because a lot of us just live in different places. And mm -hmm. I would say some of the healthier, quote unquote, older friends, I don't know if I burned those bridges, but I didn't create good bonds with those people that last over time. So there are some people that I think I would like to be closer to that it's just not going to happen. And I've made efforts to pursue that and it just doesn't, you know, whatever. So. Most of my friends are kind of recovery oriented or people I've met in recovery like yourself. And yeah, I think I'm pretty happy. I'm also very happy with just a more simple life. And I think it's hard to have a lot of friends. And yeah. so, especially when you have kids and all this other stuff. So I think over the years, I've gotten better at rebuilding my social life and seeing how important that is. Yeah. One of the amazing things about getting back into golf, like an addict, for sure, although I guess it's a little healthier uh, over the past few months as I've reconnected with my old friend who I used to be best friends with. I mean, we were, I mean, sort of best friendies, you know, kind of thing since we were like 14 years old. Right. You know, awesome. I lived with the guy for, for four years or so in our 20s, maybe three years. I don't know exactly. So that's been lovely to reconnect with him. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I think I'm learning how to be a good friend. I think mm -hmm. we always are in some sense. And I had to relearn that in my recovery and I learned it through having a good sponsor mm. and learning how to be a friend or, or just had to be a good person, I guess, in relationships. So I guess one other point, which I think fits in here a little bit is I like the description of addiction or one of them 
that addiction is the narrowing of things that bring you pleasure. And so I kind of removed nothing brought me pleasure, not even friendships really, unless it was attached to getting high. So as I learned to have better relationships over the years and re- reintegrate interests into my life, like playing hockey and playing golf, yeah. golf is a new addition to that. I've been playing hockey for maybe the last five years. But yeah, for five, six, seven years, I didn't do much other than work on my recovery and try to rebuild my life. So I'm right. trying to learn how to do that now. And that's a long-winded answer to your question. Maybe you can respond with an answer to your own question as well. Sure. I know we got a few more minutes. So I guess the first question was, are we satisfied with our friend groups? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes for me it's like yes and no. Like I think I I look back, so you know, 41 years old, I've lived in different places and have like multiple different friend groups and had the really the pleasure of of knowing and being close to a lot of different people. But sometimes those relationships like don't last in the way that you want, just not because of any frenemy behavior, Mm -hmm. bad behavior. It's just people drift and I sometimes feel myself being a bit I wouldn't say sad, but something close to that where you miss old friendships and just like that, that, that environment that really was conducive, you know, sort of undergrad years, early sort of pre-family years when you just had more time, Hmm. right? um, And people were in sort of in the same neighborhood and everyone was sort of a bit more connected over things. And as you get older, you develop different interests. So I think sometimes when I think about my friend group, I... I miss aspects of what I thought I used to have. And then I try to think about, okay, what have I done? So in, in, in the Stoic mm. tradition, what have I done to not cultivate some of those relationships? Sometimes it's just like impossible. People leave, you know, you sort of just drift based on personal interest, no one's fault. So I think a bit about that. So there's a bit of nostalgia, a bit of like, okay, how can I um, take some ownership and, and really prioritize like keeping these because it takes work right it takes like time Mm -hmm. you got to like you know if you're busy with work if you're busy with other things you have to carve out a few hours sometimes a few times a week to hang out with your friends and keep those relationships going the thing that i've also thought about in my life is i i tend to take on like projects or like passion projects hobbies that maybe helps me cultivate relationships with some people but then like you just don't have time for the other ones if that makes sense. So then it's hard to figure out like how my how I, how I how should I be spending my time? So for example, like I'm you know, you're a golf addict, I'm like a tennis addict <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, okay, I have to play a bunch of times a week otherwise I'm not going to be good. Like I'm just not going to get good at this sport. Sometimes that means I have to play late at night. Like last night I had to play from like 9 to 11 p.m. I hate that time slot. That could be a time slot I'm just sort of hanging around with some of my mm. friends or with my you know my yeah, yeah, my wife. So these are all like trade-offs and I never, and you know, I talked to my partner, Michelle, about this, like, how do we manage our lives? Like, what should we be prioritizing? Is it sitting around chatting? Is it doing physical exercise? Is it working on a passion project in that, in those free moments that you have, especially when like the kids are asleep, like that's that little moment. You're like, all right, now what am I going to do? Should I just sit on the couch and, and watch them and eat dinner and that's it? Or do I go do something? How do I spend those early mornings? And the early mornings aren't so stressful because you're not really going to be hanging. I mean, in your case, you go golfing very early with a, with a buddy of yours, which is awesome. It's more like later in the evening. How am I spending my evenings? So I, I think friends actually give me a some, not specific friends, friends is a life category, give me a, a bit of stress. I think a bit about have I managed all, have I stayed close to the people I should have stayed close with? Am I prioritizing my friends? enough am i reaching out enough am i being you know there for people am i being proactive in that regard so i think sometimes it's a lot to consider um Mm -hmm. and because i don't really like use a cell phone i think a big thing for me when (laughs) i I had that thought a couple minutes ago (laughs) yeah when i stopped you so i do i do do things to distance myself from Mm -hmm. people Mm -hmm. or or more i'm fine i'm trying to find my i was yeah yeah, i I live my i'm trying to find my little space on this planet right like what's the configuration that makes me good um and like you know purpose driven and and sometimes that means distancing from one and connecting with something else Mm -hmm. connecting with Mm -hmm. other people and then you you sort of move through life floating through different social networks and and you try to maintain all of these things but it's very hard so when i when i sort of stopped using a cell phone like I was not texting anymore i in in many ways i benefited from it because i would really prioritize like in-person hangouts and that was always better for me i hated 
it is just typing with people. Like we always, it was never enjoyable. It felt like a real time sink. But there's also the cost of like you're not on like these like text chains, right? So, I, but I mean, maybe that maybe that would be very useful for me because I could just you know be to be in easy contact with people. Um, but I don't know. So I ramble here because I'm constantly conflicted about how do I manage my friends? What's my what should my approach be? Who should I be close with? Who should I prioritize? Maybe the last thing I'll say is I like the feeling of where a friendship is like natural. So with you, Mike, like I feel like. I don't feel like I'm making a huge sacrifice when I make time mm -hmm. on a Friday morning, right? Like that's mm -hmm, not a mm -hmm, stressful mm -hmm. thing. I'm not like, oh, I should have done be doing this. What do I do? I don't know how to prioritize this. I got all these competing things. This seems like yeah, I want to prioritize it. So clear sense to me that's calming. But other situations, it's it's not always as straightforward. So I think it, I think friends generally are sometimes that, like I said that life card category can be a source of stress for me, and I never know what to. How to manage it if i'm doing the right things am i being the right you know a good friend to my to my friends like i said prioritizing the right people yeah 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 that was good thoughtful and honest and one thought maybe just to finish with and maybe it's just the way you're describing it it's not so much the friend category it's how do i organize my life in a way that is good something like that right and yes. socializing in communities and all that stuff is really important yeah. and it contributes to the good life so that's maybe just one thought of like, how am I perceiving this situation? And am I sort of miscategorizing the struggle? Something like that. Because for yeah. me, it's yeah. very much, I just have a hard time managing time. Yes. Right? And yes. so for me, the friends thing isn't so much, I don't know how to like have friends. It's, I don't know actually how to like, set up a date and yeah. like go on like you know set up a hangout session and do right. that right yeah it's just hard i think we're lucky like i have a lot of people around me it's just how do you find yeah, the yeah, time and yeah. prioritize yeah. the other thing i maybe the last last thing um is like when we're younger we use the f word more we use oh i'm friends mm -hmm. my best mm -hmm. friend as we get older <laughs> that sort of stops like colleague or someone we're doing something with right like you you are my friend Right. But I don't like, I wouldn't have used that word. It was just like, I like, I like hanging out with Mike and he's like a good guy and we do this little project right, together. Right, right. But like, ultimately, we're friends. Right. Hmm. And I sometimes, I think, right? <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. yeah. Friend um, of me. Are you a friend of me? I hope not. Oh, God. I hope not. <laughs> I'm probably maybe in some situations. Shit. Sorry if I am. But also, like, with my, like, with some of the guys I've met through tennis. Yeah. I'm like, oh, maybe those are my friends because, like, we email a lot and we yeah. organize, we yeah, hang yeah, out. Yeah. 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 It doesn't have to be like, oh, if I'm not seeing my childhood friends, therefore I'm right. like, yeah, it's sort yeah, of yeah, that yeah, yeah, also yeah, throws yeah. me off. Like there's yeah. these people that we are, we're close with that I think we don't categorize mm -hmm. properly. And mm -hmm. then we think we're, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, we're yeah, more yeah, isolated yeah, than yeah, we actually yeah, are. Yeah. Does yeah. that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, you, you, you made a good point. Like people you're connected to th through recovery, they are your friends. Yeah. But maybe it took you a bit of time to categorize them in that way. Yeah, because it wasn't like you met them in, yeah, as yeah, like you yeah, were playing yeah. with them in their backyard yeah. as an eight year old. <laughs> yeah. So. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. It does definitely make sense. Yeah. I think you got to go, so we okay. should we should wrap it up. Yeah. I'm gonna have a nap. Thanks, friend. <laughs> Thanks, friend. <laughs> that was fun. All right. Take it easy, everybody. Bye. Bye. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content, and otherwise, have a great day. Peace out. <laughs>